thank you very much. Um, to all who managed uh, in this haphazard uh, move from the GoToWebinar platform to Zoom, and this is not an advertising uh, uh, block here of the whole web seminar that we are holding today, um, we apologize for, for the short notice shift. Uh, we were facing some technical difficulties and are still hoping that a few more uh, participants will actually be able to move from the GoToWebinar to this Zoom that we've just sent a couple of minutes ago to all of you. Um, I see we have 26 persons who already were able to join. Um, I will wait for uh, a message from uh, one of our colleagues, Sinshaw, about the, the up the next um, participants to join. So we, we take another three minutes and we'll start half an hour belated today. Um, I'm very sorry for that, um, but uh, I have already skipped, or I will skip a few of my uh, slides in the introduction here. Um, for all of you who have joined for the first time of uh, the DBCO web seminar, this is a series of seminars that we are holding. Um, this is the fourth one um, on uh, pretreatment and uh, digestive use. Um, so I'm really happy to see um, more people coming in. So it's worth uh, to wait for a couple of uh, seconds. Thank you, Sincha. I see your message that you have forwarded the email to all the participants who have um, registered. Um, so we'll we'll wait for. A a few more minutes and then start with the with the content. Um, one advice from my side on the technical <laughs> uh, topic, um, please mute yourself. Um, not sure if the link that we've shared allows you to unmute. I think so. So that's not on purpose. Um, for questions during the presentations, we will use the chat function. So make sure that you have the the um, the the screen the smaller screen with the chat um, open as well if you want to have um, a conversation so there's some one from us is monitoring the chat um, we won't allow with this huge number of people attending to um, use your microphone and for the sake of um, bandwidth um, i'd ask you also to keep the video off um, I'll switch on mine in a minute, so you actually get a face to the the one who's presenting. Um, that makes it a bit more natural. And again, my apologies for for the short notice move. Um, we hope that um, we can at least uh, provide you with uh, all the information. In general. The presentations um, and uh, a recording, probably, uh, if that works on Zoom, um, will be shared later on um, via email or and uh, via the DBCO website. So um, stay tuned to our project. Uh, we will provide you with the um, with the information then. All right. Okay, I don't see more people actually uh, coming. So as we are already half an hour late, I'll just start with the introduction. And uh, if somebody joins in later, we will repeat uh, at the end that we are sharing the presentations and uh, give access to it um, via our website. So uh, nothing from the information side will be lost. And um, we hope that you can enjoy the, the session today. So you probably should see my video now as well, and I'll uh, and still have the um, presentation online as well. Um, maybe Franz or Bernhard, can you quickly confirm that you can also see the main slide now? Perfect. All right, <laughs> great. So yes, um, welcome to this um, fourth um, part of the webinar series from the DBCO project. Um, I'm quite happy that at least 30 people from the initial 80 registered made it to this um, seminar. Um, 
we had some technical difficulties, so we moved to this platform. Um, um, I will just give you a very brief introduction uh, from the coordinator's point of view to this um, project. Tipico, the Digital Global Biogas Corporation, um, aims to develop an app and application, develop applications for innovative digital and non-digital support actions. Um, we facilitate knowledge transfer which, and capacity building, which this web seminar is actually one part of. And we are also identifying and supporting so-called demo and follower cases in a more tailored support. Um, the overall outcomes that we are expecting um, are to create business collaboration and to increase the deployment of European biogas technologies to Latin America, Africa, and Southeast Asia. So we are working in Indonesia, Ghana, Ethiopia, uh, South Africa, and um, have very, very many European partners as well. Um, our aim is to increase the share of renewable energies. Um, and um, uh, contribute to the UN Development um, SDG Goal 7, Affordable and Clean Energy. Um, the five components to achieve these goals are um, intensive information exchange, um, facilitate cooperation among various stakeholders um, globally, um, to develop a digital platform that helps um, capacity building, but also virtual matchmaking, networking, and is also used for the dissemination of um, information. Um, we support, as I mentioned, demo cases um, in all of our partner countries um, up to the investment stage. So they, these are not going to be built by the end of Dibico. That would be over ambitious. Um, but uh, we will try to support them as much as possible um, to, to the level of um, uh, pre-feasibility stage, so to say. And um, we also promote and improve national, regional and local policies um, by linking them up with European policymakers and um, learning from the experience in Germany, um, Austria, but also in general from Europe. Um, the online information and virtual matchmaking tool is really at the core of, um, of, our, of our project. So it supports um, bridging the gap between European information providers um, uh, and technology providers, while on the other hand, um, we want to build up new consortia, new project partnerships, um, and um, yeah, get uh, closer to each other. And this is particularly interesting at this very difficult time with the COVID uh, corona crisis pandemic situation where um, non-virtual matchmaking formats are actually um, uh, yeah, not, not happening. So there are no physical events, no fairs, no global fairs where there's a good chance for African, Asian, uh, Latin American partners to come to Europe uh, and vice versa to get to know each other and the technologies behind. So we think we can really contribute to that um, topic at this uh, very moment in these times. So yeah, um, the idea is to um, in, uh, facilitate as an information hub, a database for European and non-European companies, um, provide guidance solutions, so actually giving some insights into the technology available, uh, form a B2B batch matchmaking tool, and um, offer convenient networking uh, opportunities. So all of this will be based on, on, on our core um, yeah, outcome, the, one of the, the, the digital matchmaking and information platform. Um, I see more and more people uh, joining, which is, which is absolutely great. Um, I've just started to do the introduction. Um, Mr. River, um, also thank you, and uh, Tibebu for, for joining. Um, due to bandwidth uh, topics issues, we, we ask you to mute yourself uh, and also switch off um, video if possible. Um, I know sometimes it's difficult to find this uh, if you are tuned in from a handheld, so no big, big deal. Um, sorry for the inconvenience that we caused by switching uh, to a different platform. I guess 
it happens uh, always and sometimes um, uh, in other for other programs and uh, settings as well. So I'm happy that you are here and we will share all the information that we've provided or will provide also later on via our website. Um, um, yeah, we do have um, a huge consortium. I just showed you um, our um, all the logos from all the partners ranging from the European, Austrian, German Biogas Association, um, energy agency in Austria, and uh, also and then, um, yeah, think tanks on the energies, renewable energy sector in, in Europe. But also we do have uh, big partners in, in South Africa, you will get to know one, um, uh, Indonesia, Argentina, uh, Ghana, and uh, Ethiopia. Um, so how can you actually take part? Yes, participate in our web seminar series. This is what you're currently doing, but also register as a stakeholder on our platform. Get information and advisory from, from within the team, within the consortium. Um, um, there's also opportunities to advertise your own biogas project opportunity on the platform. Um, more to come soon. So there will be a specific uh, webinar, web seminar on, on this particular topic as well. So I'll shut up here as I promised to save a few more minutes as we were already delayed right from the beginning. Happy to see that we have now 45 people joining in again for those who joined late um we are very sorry for the inconvenience caused and um i'll hand over to my colleague bernhard now for the next announcement thank you hello all together uh, sorry also from my side for uh, the inconvenience uh, we will start uh, now with uh, josef Höckner. Uh, he is uh, his uh, presentation is about uh, pretreatment of agricultural residues. Uh, please be aware that uh, you can't uh, speak in because it would be uh, a problem. So if uh, questions arise, please type in in the chat function. You can find it uh, if you touch the screen or uh, move your mouse uh, downside and you can uh, find the chat version. So you type in uh, the questions you have and after the presentation, we will uh, discuss the questions uh, which arise. Thank you and Josef, it's your turn. Okay, fine, thank you. Just uh, share my screen, one minute. We now see the. You see the screen, no? Yeah, yeah the screen with the go to meeting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, now it's better, perfect. I think. Perfect. That's Good. Welcome also from me to all. Yes, today we will talk about the pre treatment of agricultural residues, but especially uh, about straw and uh, special corn straw. Um, we are on a from a biogas plant also, um, from a 500 kilowatt biogas plant. Uh, Biochip build also technical components for biogas production uh, for straw and manure. So these are, these are our material mix, mainly corn straw. You can see this, 67% uh, are corn straw in our biogas plant. 12% um, it's cow and horse manure, then summer and winter catch crops, 9%. Uh, straw from cereals, rep and soy, it's 7% uh, and 5% of landscape material and grass. And 2000 cubic meter of pig slurry. Yeah, this is our material mix. Um, the pretreatment steps for agricultural residues, uh, these are three main parts. The first main part is the harvesting. Um, everyone knows about harvesting technology for cereal straw, but uh, nobody or the, not a lot of people know how we can harvest uh, corn straw from the field. 
Then the next step will be the storage. And the third one is the treatment before the digester. This is, um, yeah, many treatments uh, options are possible, but uh, due to the low feeding tariffs in Austria, we always have to find the most efficient way for us. And in our case, is this the mechanical uh, treatment. Um, here start the first pretreatment step uh, with the biochipper. We have a mulcher. The mulcher suck the straw uh, from the from the field, shred it, and bring it uh, into a 12 meter sword. Um, we can see this here on this video. Here's the harvester. We harvest the corn for food industry, uh, whatever. Here are the biochipper, and on the back side are the uh, loader wagon. Uh, here's knives with a distance of uh, five centimeter. And the cut, the shredded material, and press the material into the wagon. Um, why not with the forage harvester? Um, the problem are the low specific weight after the forage harvester. The loader wagon press the material or the straw into the wagon and the density are two and a half times higher like after the forage harvester. This is why we use these uh, loaders. Then you can, yeah, you can store the straw um, on the silage clamp. Um, it is too dry, maybe, especially for a cereal straw. Then we spray also water on the material. Otherwise, it can start um, to burn, maybe, uh, especially in areas where you have a too little density. Uh, here, maybe can the material, material really burn. And over 85%, you can also make it bells, round bells, or square bells. It's also square bells is also possible, but really only with very dry material. So, and you can also mix this material with um, summer catch crops, or also with landscape material, whatever, or beet pulp. Um, the summer catch crops are a mixing of clover, sunflowers, oil radish, and other plants. And the harvest time is during the corn straw harvesting or the corn straw harvest period. And it's a very good combination with corn straw. Straw is very dry, summer crops very wet, but together makes a very good silage. Then the treatment before digesting, it's first the dosing, then the shaded, shredding or, or defibration, whatever, then the solid feeding and the liquid feeding. For the question solid or liquid feeding, um, basically the drier the material, the higher the density, uh, the, the, the tendency uh, towards liquid feeding. Otherwise, you get problems with swim layers or floating layers on the top of the digester. Uh, but this also depends on the stereos in the digester. But normally, if it's drier, then the way you go more to, to liquid feeding. And so we have a look, especially for the liquid feeding. Uh, the requirements for the feeding line, it's, yeah, do you need a constant eating uh, and even dosing? This is uh, very often a problem for a lot of uh, biogas plants. Then the stones and steel and other metaphor materials very often a problem in the in the biogas plants. Uh, but the the shredding line have to have to handle this. The increase of the surface of the surface of the material is very important. This is why we do this. We need surface for the bacterials. Then also the communication between the technical com components is also very important. No bridge, uh, no blockages on the augers or in the shredder. 
then uh, yeah, low wear and low power consumption, it's also a big part. And also for the whole system, uh, C certification, also the risk analyze for the whole feeding line. These are the most important points. If we look for a um, normal liquid feeding line, here we can see um, the store for the, for the feeding line, the dissolving, uh, then the dosing, uh, the fraying or shredding, then the liquid pump, the liquid mix pump, and the liquid pump uh, to mix liquid into the mix pump. Short distance are always important uh, to erect very quickly uh, to different materials. Now we have a look at this in detail. Uh, yeah, the storage are possible from five until 400 cubic meters. Um, here we can see the dissolving. Uh, we push the material with the walking floor on the front and the dissolving augers uh, um, bring the material up and dissolve this dissolve the material uh, before we go into the dosing auger here in this horizontal line. Here we can see the dosing auger. And the dissolving and dosing unit uh, bring the material very uh, even uh, to the fraying machine. This is also very important. Here are the fraying machines. And yeah, we, have, we work with two different uh, shredding or uh, defibration machines. And yeah, only to increase uh, the contact surface, yes, for our bacteria. Uh, we have adapted all the shredders, so they can work with a lot of different materials automatically. The next one are the mix pump. So after shredding, the shredded material, the defibrated material, go into the uh, mixing area from the mix pump over there. Um, the liquid come from the liquid dosing pump and here on the front is the mixing area. So we mix outside of the digester. Uh, we mix the material, uh, get, we, we will go in the liquid phase in this point and the liquid material go back to the digester. Here the liquid feeding pump. Here we can see the whole line. Uh, the material come outside from the digester into the liquid feeding pump, from the liquid pump, feeding pump uh, via the flow meter into the uh, mix pump, from the mix pump back to the digester. Yeah, all of these technologies and sensors have to be connected in one control and electric system. And the best uh, case, if you can work without any other interfaces. Interfaces normally always problems. And so it's better if you have no or not a lot of interfaces. Yes, that's from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the the time. <laughs> you you uh, you would have another minute, but uh, we can go to to questions. Please uh, type in the chat room. I will uh, talk the 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 questions so uh, Josef can answer it. Was it uh, clear for everyone? Okay, uh, then uh, I would say we we go to Matthias uh, and we can save some time uh, at the end of the webinar for a question also uh, to Josef. Matthias, yes. would you yes. share your 
Would you share the, your, your screen, please? Yes. You can see the screen. You can see the screen. And now the first uh, slides. Thank you. Fine. Please, Thank you on. very much. You're welcome. Um, I will present you uh, some yeah, slides and an overview about the pretreatment of industrial and commercial waste. Uh, mainly in Germany. First of all, how does it look like? We have in Germany around about 350 to 400 waste uh, AD plants, uh, 135 plants for bio waste from households, which are separate collected in the bio waste bin. We have 250 plants for industrial and commercial wastes. 40 plants for packed food stuff. It's also a substrate for biogas plants and 10 uh, mechanical biological treatment plants without use of digestate as a fertilizer. So uh, vegetable byproducts go or were used in agricultural plants in Germany. Um, we have nearly up to 9 million tons per year approved input capacity. That means 510 to 500,000 tons a year per plant and an installed electric capacity about 350 megawatt. That means 975 kilowatt per plant. The distribution of waste input in Germany looks like bio waste from households. We have about around about 30%, 50% about mesh from alcohol production, nearly percent from fat contents, uh, expired food, manure, green waste, energy crops, and other bio waste, and also catering waste. Um, when we want to generate uh, biogas from bio waste, we have several steps. Uh, on the left side, you see uh, the different fractions where we can generate uh, bio waste. Uh, so municipal bio, bio waste, um, industrial commercial wastes, uh, the next step would be the disintegration and unpacking technologies. If you use um, expired food, for example, the sanitation step, the dry removal of impurities and the liquid removal of impurities, which is uh, very important. Uh, then we have different uh, biogas plant technologies, uh, wet or dry continuous digestion or the dry batch system. And on the end, we can generate digestate as fertilizer or fuel, biomethane, heat coat, and or electricity. So the sanitation and stabilization step uh, for bio waste uh, AD plants is very important. Um, we have four options to do that so that we can uh, produce a sanitized and stabilized digestate on the end. Option one is the thermophilic digestion. There we need a temperature of, of, of about 50 degrees uh, during a minimum hydraulic retention time. Option two is the pasteurization with, with an, uh, a temperature of over 70 degrees for one hour and the input material has to be maximum 12 millimeters because of the temperature inside of the particle. And after that, a mesophilic digestion. Um, option three is the thermophilic composting or on under option four, other validated methods. Which technologies we can use for the waste digestion? Um, this de uh, depends mainly also from the dry matter content of the bio waste and its source. So here we see um, when we have for example, green waste, we can use the dry batch system where we can uh, use 30% to 50% dry matter content. Uh, alternative, the wet uh, digestion system where we have the possibility to use lower dry matter contents between 5 to 20% or in the middle, the dry continuous system between 50% up to 45%. So um, this is my favorite slide because uh, the feedstock quality is the key when we want to use uh, bio waste for the uh, energy production, fertilizer production. 
Uh, on, on one side, we have many problems sometimes um, with uh, impurities and oversized components, which we uh, collect over the, the bio bins or other sources. So uh, for the plants, uh, main goal must be to avoid the malfunction in the biogas plant by impurities. But on the other side, we want to produce a high quality organic fertilizer on the end. So um, we don't want to have uh, any contaminants like heavy metals inside. And also the public acceptance for the bio waste recycling is very important. So here we have the plastic discussion uh, and impurities uh, like plastics, yes. And uh, in Germany, we have more than 30 years um, experiences with uh, separate bio waste collection and uh, handling with impurities uh, in, in biogas plants. Therefore, um, when we, we see there are different plants who use uh, different substrates from different sources, so there we have some technical challenges because uh, the material, uh, the impurity itself can have an influence to the um, biogas plant and its technique. So for example, plastic is very light and is swimming in the digester. So it, it, the behavior is in, in a little bit uh, different to, to metals or uh, glass or wood. Um, so. Um, the influence of the material is very important uh, to choose for the, for, for, for the technical we, we want to use. So here we see different um, categories of materials like plastic, metal, PPK, glass or wood, like fruit crates. Um, another point is the characteristic of the material. Because um, when we have here, for example, we have rough oversized contaminants like pellets, roots or meat hooks, they can clog some uh, devices in the plant or other uh, things like uh, spinning material, like stretchy things like nets, tapes, enrolled plastics. They can wrap around steering devices. So there we have also some uh, problems in the plant, but also sand like fine mineral components, which is sinking to the bottom of the digester. Uh, or grid st like stones, gravel, grass fragments, bones, eggshells, small metal parts or sea shells, which we can find in the bio waste. Um, the problem is the mixture of uh, different uh, materials like mixed packaging, uh, as we as before mentioned, for example, glass in the wood cover or a metal cover. And also a problem in each uh, waste source, uh, which uh, can be separate collected, uh, is uh, the problem with the wild throw, like clothes, decoration articles, or beauty care products, which uh, uh, are in the bio waste to find. But also the food waste itself can have uh, some effects to the technical uh, devices. So when we can imagine like flu fluid food waste, like a tetra pack or something like that with milk or so. Uh, it's very easy to, to open the, the packaging to, to get out the organic, what we want to have for the uh, energy production. But uh, other things like soft food waste, like fruits or vegetable or cheese, cheese which is sticking on the packaging, it's a little bit difficult to, to uh, separate from the packaging. So other things are sausage, dairy products, pastries or duff, and also hard food waste like meat and slaughterhouse waste or frozen convenience products, which can uh, make some problems uh, or effects to the technical devices like heating or something like that. Um, kitchen and catering waste is also a separate collected um, waste source. Um, there we have also some wild throws like spoons. So this is the problem. Swelling food waste on the end, um, like dry food or uncooked cooked food uh, is also a, a yeah, character of the waste. So here we see a schematic uh, graph how uh, it can be yeah 
the process of a wet AD for expired food on we divide it in, in two parts. Uh, the left side is the depacking side where we have to unpack uh, the packaging material and separate uh, the uh, fraction of impurities and the organic goes to the biological step. Um, but you can also find techniques uh, in, in combination like separation crusher or separation pulper. And on the other side, the separation of impurities, which can be before the biolog biological step, but also before the digestion, during the digestion or after the AD process. So here inside we have uh, the possibility to separate sinking uh, or swimming material. So now I come uh, at this time to the conclusions. Uh, for Germany, it's a little bit special because we have a fast increase of biogas plants, which are based on energy crops, but also we have a share of 5%, nearly uh, 400 plants for the waste AD systems. We have uh, various technologies which are available for the AD process of waste and residues, but uh, the concept uh, which technology we have to use depends on the amount of and kind of waste, like I mentioned, dry matter content or impurities. And um, finally, the purity of the bio waste is very important. One point is avoiding malfunctions of the plant, but on the other side, the production of high quality fertilizer for closing nutrient circles and reducing waste volume. So the separate collection is um, one part, but in I, I think international also uh, the mixed waste uh, can be a first step to uh, a separate collection. So um, further information you can have over uh, our website as free download, uh, the Biowaste Biogas brochure, which was uh, supported by the GZ, the Indian Biogas Association, and the ISWA International and Solid Waste Association. At this time I'm ready and finished, and I hope we can meet and see you in the virtual annual meeting, the Biogas Convention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. Also, you have uh, saved a couple of minutes. So uh, if you have questions, please type in the chat room. Uh, there are cool two, two questions uh, so far I've seen. So Mr. Matthias, do you have experience using empty fruit bunch from palm oil fruits as feedstock to generate biogas? Empty fruits? From palm stocks. From palm, yeah. Empty fruit bunches from palm fruit. Maybe we can ask in turn if really experienced, in, I don't think so, uh, in Germany not, but uh, maybe on international side, uh, but uh, maybe we can answer this question a special in a special email. Mm -hmm. So the next uh, question was, uh, do you have any experience using biochar in the di digester for increasing gas or methane yields? Biochar? Biochar, yes. It's Not directly. Right? <laughs> well, it, it would, biochar will only help if you have problems in the digestion, if you have a, a very high acid concentration, otherwise it makes no sense. Or if you have a very fast digestion process, so you have only a retention time of one hour or maybe one day, then biochar is a very valuable source. And the third question, uh, do you apply feed-in tari tariff, the energy input and the output energy? What, the, um, not, this is a little bit... Uh, what was the question? Uh, do you apply feed in, is there a feed-in tariff for uh, biogas product, uh, 
electricity production from biogas plants with uh, with uh, biogenic uh, wastes. I think I didn't understand the question in the right way. The feeding. Um, so, so, sorry, Matthias, may I reply for you? It's, okay. The, the question is really not clear. Sure, Germany has a feed-in tariff for organic waste treatment in biogas plants. The output, the electricity, will be reimbursed with special feed-in tariffs. Is so the, 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 the fee of the... Um, yeah. No, no, electricity. No, no. You get the fee for the electricity, yes. Yes. And maybe a fee for the organic waste stream. This, this depends on the market. But yes, the main question was you get the feed in tariff for the produced energy. Oh. Yes, for organic waste, you have a feed in tariff. Yes, that, that's right. Um, but uh, I understand it uh, like uh, what you can get for the for the waste as source, if you get money from the waste. But this is not the question, I think. Uh, this is regional different. The question was, do you apply feed in tariffs? Feed in tariffs is yes. typical the energy output. And for the do you mean a gate fee for the organic waste? This is really depending on the local situation yes. and yeah. on the feedstock, on the type of feedstock. Yeah. It is a, a sanitized feedstock already pre-treated, then you may have to pay if you have to do yourself collecting, if you have to do yourself sanitation, crushing, decontamination, then you get paid. Yes. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe I allow myself to, to jump in here. Um, uh, not not sure exactly where the question comes from, from which uh, continent and, and uh, local circumstances, but as Franz uh, mentioned and said, uh, this is regionally very different in Germany, um, depending on the area you're operating, um, as we are a federal state, um, it depends a lot on, on, on the federal government and also local government uh, legislation. If um, uh, pre-sorted um, organic waste at the household level. So, uh, okay, thank you, Sincha from Ethiopia. Um, we we do have um, different systems here, uh, and that varies on a very small scale, <laughs> so to say. So, in some areas, you have to um, do uh, source separation at home, um, while if your biogas uh, plant is mainly um, uh, working with commercial uh, food processing industries, for example, you might have to um, think about setting up a clear uh, structure on how that source separation, separation is actually happening, so it feeds best into your anaerobic digestion. Uh, plant. So um, that's that's one of the recommendations. Um, in terms of um, there's one, there's one person not muted, please. Um, in in terms of the feed-in tariffs, um, I think um, uh, that uh, in in some areas they, or in, in some uh, during some times it was uh, an, an additional. Um, a renumeration for um, energy from renewable sources. So it was politically driven to to have uh, additional uh, tariff or uh, feed-in tariff um, uh, for the energy produced by biogas plants. Um, so um, is the is the question. Uh, Somewhat clear. I have the the additional question about uh, the feed-in tariffs. Is uh, the question because uh, arising because the technology might be expensive for Ethiopia? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is really difficult because the technology is. In, in Germany, on the high end level, that's clear. But may, maybe the national or in, in Ethiopia, the first goal must be to to a, a separate collection to to get the possibility uh, to make some uh, yeah 
development in in this. So uh, maybe the first step can be uh, a mechanical biological treatment plant at first, maybe. So uh, away from the, clo uh, the the open dump sites, for for example. And the next step, if uh, you can generate um, a good quality of separate collected bio waste, then maybe could could be uh, possible. But this is really difficult to say. In big cities, maybe on on countryside, I don't know. Okay, uh, we have to move on a little bit. I have uh, um, another uh, answer to the, the question before by using uh, to using biochar. I ask a, a colleague who is uh, using biochar in the digestion, and he says uh, there there is no more uh, gas yield or methane yield uh, so far. The the ID plant is working well, so the Biochar uh, increase the gas uh, yields if there are problems uh, like toxic uh, materials or something like this. So the biology biology is is uh, yeah there are problems with the biology. So the next question is: uh, Is it appropriate to design a tubular digester based on poultry menu, especially when the birds are raised on substrate like sawdust. Very specific question. Pork <laughs> with, menu and? Uh, poultry menu uh, with the with sawdust. With sawdust. Segerspiene. Segerspiene. Es geht schlecht. Boah, das ist der very difficult. Mist, yeah. Der Geflügelmist wird vergehren und die Späne bleiben. In English, yes. please. <laughs> it's, it's, um, they will swimming on, as a level or a layer, maybe. So I, I think um, technical problems, maybe, yes. But uh, you will get no gas out of, of the wood. So not really. So. Um, from the menu, we can generate energy, but from uh, lignin, like or uh, yeah, lignin, um, it's not really possible to, to generate energy, and maybe also mm -hmm. technical problems on on the end. Yes. Okay. So uh, woody uh, substrates are not able to digest it. Uh, the organic material besides is is a good energy yeah. source. Yeah. So another question is, uh, do you consider the climate change for your biogas digester? I think the, is the, the question going uh, the energy uh, necessity, uh, the heat necessity or the, the substrate? Uh, Changes. Um, no, exactly what. So in in Germany, uh, maybe um, I think we will have a change in the substrate input material uh, the next ten years. But um, in in history, we had uh, very much uh, substrate from from energy or agricultural. Uh, Side so um, the future brings us residues and and more waste a substrate to the plants or a mixture about uh, residues from from the agriculture side. So, um, hmm. but it's also <laughs> very difficult to say how um, how will be the future here. So I mean I think it will be a change yes a little bit in in Germany. Okay. So the next uh, question was, uh, can you comment on sonification as a possible pre-treatment pre method? I think France has uh, quite uh, experience with it. <laughs> sonification, oh, I, I'm, for me, I have no <laughs> experience, but, uh, but... France has experience. <laughs> okay. We are involved in a project with ultrasonic as pre-treatment technique. 
uh, <clears throat> the, the outcome was on this specific topic not clear, but sure we have to consider that maybe the, the, the trials were not wide enough, have not been wide enough. So you have to treat or to search a little bit more. Ultrasonic is a very wide topic. You have very specific uh, energy input possibilities and very specific topics on the feedstock needs to be treated or wants to be treated because if it's dry, you don't have any effect with ultrasonic. You have to have a wet system and then it depends on how you treat it with which level of ultrasonic. And the one step we did or the, the university did, it was not a success, but doesn't say that ultrasonic is not effective in all. That's that I wouldn't underwrite. Would... Okay. Bist du draußen? Yes, Mitter. I'm, so I'm I here. Think... Oh, okay. So uh, I was I was knocked out for a moment. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the next the next uh, question arises because of plastics. It's uh, for you, Matthias. Are there expected problems with plastics in their digest state in the future due to possible stricter regulations? Um, this question comes from Germany. <laughs> <laughs> Or not? No, no. <laughs> but okay. this is a this is a, a, a bigger problem. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. First of all, if we have um, wild growth in in different waste sources, so this is a big problem in 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 generally. So when we begin at the collection, we have to show that uh, the public acceptance is a, a good quality. Uh, feedstock uh, stock to, to generate on the source. This is one point. On the other side, during the biogas process, um, we have some technical aspects where we can separate the impurities like plastics out. On the end, um, we have some um, restrictions when we have to uh, when we want to have to uh, use the digestate as fertilizer. So on this side, um, the restrictions uh, maybe can be uh, stronger, but uh, the problem is uh, we have no methods to measure how many plastic is on the end uh, in the digest state because um, we need um, analysis for microplastics, for example. We have only uh, in the restrictions in generally, I think in the next time one millimeter of plastics and uh, all parts which are smaller. Uh, we have no analysis for this. So um, there are some studies. I, I know one study there where we can see how, uh, how big it's a part of, of microplastic in, in littering to the marine um, sea. So uh, we have in, in, in Germany about not not really one percent, which is coming from the agriculture side, and also of uh, biogas plants uh, who use um, uh, uh, substrates from uh, the bio waste. Um, on the other side, we have in the, in the traffic uh, the problem with the microplastic over the uh, transport sector, like the um, um, the wheels of the vehicles. So. Uh, it's more than 50% input to the marine uh, ocean. So um, I yeah, think so the yeah. problem is a global uh, It's a global problem, not, yes. It's not always uh, the digested, but uh, we have to be aware, I think. Yes, and but yeah. uh, only one point, if you use expired food, so you have the possibility to open the uh, packaging and not crushing or um, milling it uh, to small parts of, of plastic. So you, you want to separate the plastic in, as, a, as a big part out of this. So the, I think the impact of uh, foodstuff, expired foodstuff in the biogas technology is not that problem. 
as it maybe will be discussed in the in the public. There are also investigations about about diet digestate uh, um, to, and plastic input uh, or plastic parts uh, in the digestate from the uh, quality assurance. So the digestate is virtually virtually free from uh, plastic. There are investigations and publications about that. Yes. I, I need to jump in. We we uh, need to to go to uh, our next uh, presentation. Uh, I will hold on. Uh, there are three. Okay, there are two questions and I, one uh, statement. Uh, I will don't forget about it. Uh, but we uh, need to jump to uh, yeah. Yasin. And but it's possible to send me an email also. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Yasin. Thank you very much, Bernard. Um, the arena is yours. <laughs> yeah. Can I confirm that you can see the presentation? The presentation is fine. Yeah, and you can hear me quite clearly as well. Yes, perfect. Awesome, fantastic. Thanks so much to um, my colleagues from the European Union, from Germany and Austria for sharing the, the experience around pre treatment technologies. Um, I was asked to present um, some of the learnings uh, for pre-treatment of feedstock um, from South Africa. Um, to give you a bit more background on myself, my name is Yasin Sali. I'm the bioenergy analyst for Green Cape and I'm also the project lead for Green Cape in terms of the um, consortium. Um, in terms of Green Cape itself, it's a non-profit organization that basically drives the widespread adoption of economic viable um, green economy solutions and where does this fit in with, with biogas market um, essentially we basically have a lot of stakeholder engagements and we try and identify what barriers need to be unlocked and what enablers there are for the development and growth of biogas market and the broader green economy so to give you an idea on this um, one of the things that we've been working on is looking at um, what is sort of the success conditions for the implementation of biogas projects within South Africa. Um, and we've broken it down in terms of our investigation through stakeholder engagements to various sections. One of it is the feedstock. Um, and basically I'll share with you learnings from at least three case studies um, where um, the feedstock had either had a um, sort of created a barrier for that project in terms of uh, operating efficiently or, or it was an enabler for that project um, in terms of uh, successfully implementing that project. Um, in general, the, the pre-treatment of feedstock in South Africa is very important. And the reason being is that um, South Africa doesn't have source separation that's um, um, implemented within the country. Um, or at least there's very little um, areas or municipalities that do implement it or that are only trialing it at the moment. What this essentially means is from the sort of commercial, industrial, residential space is that um, a lot of the feedstock that is available for biogas um, plants, which is quite a high amount in terms of its potential, um, it's likely to be contaminated um, with either the packaging um, to plastics or paper, etc. Or, or sand in terms of your municipal or solid waste general collection or even your um, agricultural residues in terms of livestock manure whether it be your dairy manure or feedlot manure or even your um, piggeries or poultry manure as well so that could often be contaminated with sand and legal cellulosis of contaminants um, in your municipal and commercial industrial space the concern is besides the packaging is also the high metal content um, that was mentioned by Matthias in his presentation. A third sort of um, concern within the South African locale is that the accessibility of feedstock is often an issue as well. Um, you may have a potential uh, feedstock generator that generates a large volumes of feedstock, but they may be located uh, in an area, um, industrial area or urban area, where it's not easy to build a biogas plant. Therefore, you need to collect that feedstock and the distance to where you set up your plant might be an issue. 
So um, that is also a, a big concern in terms of um, the distance from where the feedstock is generated to where the plant is built. On sites where um, the plant uh, is built on where the feedstock is generated, for example, on farms, the concern there is that that farming site might not generate sufficient amount of feedstock um, to, to ideally produce the amount of biogas um, and that can make the project viable from a financial sense. Um, and also that site might have restricted access to it in terms of the way it operates. So for example, if a plant is built on a piggery or a feedlot and that um, site implements high biosecurity um, measures, um, it would be very difficult to bring other feedstock on site, um, which basically reduces the potential output of the biogas plant. Um, as it can only work with the uh, feedstock that is generated on site. So these are the sort of issues around feedstock within South Africa, and it's key to sort of address this them in terms of pre-treatment and, and management of, the, of these feedstocks to ensure that um, if a biogas plant is built based on whatever feedstock is generated, that it can operate efficiently um, because a pre-treatment or a ha um, good handling strategy is in place for that feedstock. In terms of, of learnings from South Africa, there's three case studies that, that I want to mention. Um, the first one is a New Horizons energy plant um, that is situated in the Western Cape. All three sites are situated in the Western Cape. Um, and this New Horizons energy plant was sort of considered um, a, sort of a leader or first of its kind. Um, the idea was to sort of treat the organic fraction of municipal solid waste. Um, this plant was designed with a uh, materials recovery facility so that it could extract organic fraction from municipal solid waste. Um, however, um, it met a lot of challenges in the sense that um, the municipal solid waste that it would manage to get access to had a lot of contaminants to, in it. So initially designing the plant for a municipal solid waste stream of, um, consisting of 40% organic fraction, um, it actually only managed to get a municipal solid waste stream of, with an organic fraction of 20%. Uh, added to that, there was a lot of sand um, and metal components and glass included in that municipal waste stream. And that's primarily because um, we don't have separation at source within the country implemented on, on, on national scale. Um, and obviously, um, it's a very diverse profile in terms of municipal solid waste. Um, but having those contaminants in the material recovery facility, um, it sort of caused a lot of um, mechanical issues to the extraction of the organic fraction um, and ended up costing the project a lot more. Um, this project as a result now is sort of um, non-operational and they're looking to revive it, but um, they've learned from the past and they're only looking to take on more or less contaminated um, the uh, feedstock streams. So they're looking at more your sort of wet waste from your uh, hospitality industry, as well as um, large agricultural residues where uh, they don't have access to or space to build the biogas plants or they'll transport that in. Um, and they'll try and establish the plant um, on that before they start looking at municipal solid waste again. And if they do decide to take on municipal solid waste, it'll be very selective um, to make sure that they materials and recovery facility can uh, sort of treat and extract a, a, uh, a sort of optimal uh, organic fraction with a good composition and, and as little as possible contaminants there. Um, so that's that sort of project and that's one of the larger projects in South Africa. Um, the next project that, that, that I'd like to highlight is a, what's called Zandam Cheese and Piggery. And this is a, a smaller project, so to speak. Um, smaller to medium project. Um, this project basically used the feedstock of pig manure. Um, and I think the learnings from this project is that it has a lot of potential, but um, it, in terms of the development of this project, it is key to sort of make sure that this project, which was built on site of the feedstock generator, that there's good communication in terms of the project developer or the project uh, operator and the site owner a good understanding of when the sort of feedstock would be available, uh, in what condition the feedstock would be available, and if there is sufficient infrastructure to store the feedstock and 
make sure that the feedstock is not stored for too long as it could reduce its energy potential. So an example here would be um, if the site owner decided no, that it empties out its, um, its pens and washes out that manure or at say 6 a.m. in the morning, um, you would need to ensure that you as your biogas operator that you you have sufficient space to store all that pig manure, first of all. And secondly, um, you may need to make sure that you are able to sort of feed it into your system as soon as possible because you don't want it sort of standing in the sun um, and losing its energy potential. So essentially there, I think the learning there from that project is that um, I think part of the pre-treatment uh, sort of process for feedstock is good communication with the feedstock generator or the farm owner or the site owner and ensure that um, both uh, parties are on the same page in terms of managing that feedstock so that you can get the optimal potential out of that feedstock. The last project that I want to highlight is called Onenkal Dairy. Um, this project is very unique in a sense that um, it is a sort of dairy feedlot um, that, uh, that uh, where cow manure is being uh, generated. Um, what made this project attractive or viable from a feedstock perspective is that the actual dairy farm owner, he had already infrastructure installed um, within his feedlots so that he could channel um, the manure into basically these um, cutters or channels um, directly into a collection point and into a lagoon digester. Uh, most dairies and feedlots are, are in South Africa uh, do not have that kind of infrastructure, so manure would need to be either collected out in the fields, which lose potential and carries a lot of sand, or even the, the sort of milking parlors and, 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 and feedlots do not have solid bases where you can sort of wash uh, away the manure into a channel with minimal contaminants. So in this case, um, the farm of the site owner had already uh, a very attractive infrastructure for sort of collecting and, and sort of um, making sure that there's minimal contaminants to the feedstock. So in this case, that's what drove the sort of project, um, coupled with the other aspects of the, pro the, the farm needing an energy offtake. So to summarize in terms of the case study examples, um, your Zandam cheese and piggery um, it used the pig manure there. The learning of that project was that um, what held the project back was the relationship between the operator and the feedstock generator and making sure that the, the communication channel was open and, and everyone was on the same page to improve that efficiency in terms of feedstock management. In terms of the Ullenkral dairy farm, um, that farm already had good infrastructure in place, which made it a lot easier for the operator and developer of the biogas plant to sort of uh, get that feedstock directly into the, um, the digester. And in terms of New Horizons Energy that dealt with municipal uh, solid waste feedstock, um, there it was more a challenge to ensure that the, the source of the municipal solid waste was more or less contaminated than necessary and that they had the infrastructure installed to sort of uh, extract a viable uh, fraction of organic content, so to speak. In general, in South Africa, to highlight um, the opportunities sort of um, around pre-treatment of feedstock. Um, a lot of projects uh, overlook this and, and it mainly comes from a gap between um, the site owner or, or uh, the misunderstanding between the feedstock generator and the project developer. Um, a feedstock generator might say he has X amount of, of, of feedstock, um, but he, he fails to mention maybe uh, what the condition of that feedstock in, is. Um, it may be out in the fields, uh, it may not be channeled into one location, um, which creates more problems. And the issue on the, on the project development side in terms of misunderstanding is that they don't perhaps ask those questions in terms of how they will access that feedstock. Um, and they often overlook it because of a pricing issue, because it costs more to sort of um, implement that infrastructure to collect that feedstock. And essentially what happens is you run, down, run into problems from the gas generation because you're not feeding the appropriate feedstock that was required for the design of the plant. So in a nutshell, um, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunities, um, particularly within South Africa, for, for pre-treatment technology or pre-treatment management um, solutions, um, understanding how to sort of improve the quality of the feedstock 
um, that is available and how to improve the accessibility of the feedstock that is available. Um, I'm, I'm going to close out there to sort of allow for a bit more chance for questioning, but I'd like to thank the, um, our host for allowing me to present the findings from South Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Yasin. And thank you for the time management. This was uh, very, very uh, good time management. So uh, if there are other uh, questions, please uh, type in the chat room. Uh, one question arise to your scene. Uh, how do you control the characteristics of the feedstock for consistency before feeding in the bioreactor or in other words, control of mixed ratios and subsequently CN ratio? Yeah, thanks for that question. That, that is a very interesting question because um, what essentially project developers and, and, and site owners of feedstock generators do is they, they highlight what the primary feedstock is are available. So for example, if it is your um, cow manure or your, um, your pig manure, they would do analysis of what the sort of quantities or what composition of that feedstock is. Um, and then at that point, based on the results, they will assess whether there is a need for a co-substrate or a co-feedstock that could sort of meet the requirements of, of, of design um, that they were looking to implement. Ideally, this is not the best way to design because you want to have design based on what feedstock is available and you don't want to design a plant and then end up having to look for that feedstock. But essentially, it, it, there is a monitoring process where um, uh, the, 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 pro, the operator of the plant will sort of monitor or have a good sense of what feedstock is coming in. They'll do regular testing in terms of, of the feedstock in terms of a feeding tank, um, what is the composition there. And they will basically try and adjust it. Um, whether it be, um, I've seen sites where they do chemical dosing. I've seen sites where they've actually um, added an additional substrate or the feedstock to it. So there's a number of ways they they sort of manage that. Um, they they still there isn't a sort of uh, one fit all currently within South Africa because the sites are very unique and each plant has um, different sort of characteristics. Um, but uh, essentially, uh, a lot of it can be improved. The feedstock is in the upstream, so to speak, before it reaches sort of the feeding tank, um, which makes it easier to sort of regulate that CMP ratio or that mixing ratio that you need. Okay, thank you very much. So, if there are other uh, questions, uh, please type in uh, because there is no no question for your scene uh, right now. I I will go back uh, to to a question for Josef Höckner. Josef, you're still there? Yes, I'm here. There was a question on uh, how do you see this technology for developing countries? Sorry? How do you see this technology for developing countries? So is there uh, possibilities for residues of agriculture production? Um, no, this is not dependent on the, the, lo uh, the law <laughs> develop development. Countries. Is development. It, uh, dependent on the, on the waste materials there are in these countries. And uh, if you have organic wests, also long fibres, also uh, empty fruit punches are also possible. Uh, uh, do you have to do you have to cut this only in two steps? Then it's also empty fruit punches uh, necessary for for biogas. Uh, this is really only dependent on the on the on the materials, mm -hmm. not on the countries. Or is this the wrong understanding? Uh, hopefully not. Uh, there is, there is an, well, there's an, I would, I would yeah. say the potential is huge for even for uh, South Africa and then also for Argentina, etc. Those countries in Africa are huge. We don't know them too much, but uh, 
wheat straw, barley straw, corn straw, they have it. Dennis? Yeah, but, but they have a lot of other things. They have also uh, uh, waste from the, from the uh, food industries. They have, uh, yeah, the South Africa have a, have a lot of uh, uh, corn straw, wheat straw. I've visited this country and it's a lot of material uh, in these countries. You know? And so it's uh, possible to use this our, with our technology or other technologies uh, to produce uh, gas, to produce EMT uh, or LPG. So whether uh, there is a, a comment, I hope I, I understand it right. In South Africa, we have in Gauteng about 48,000 tons of straw. What kind of straw? I don't know exactly, uh, but yeah, I, maybe. I, I, maybe I can add to that, uh, Bernard. Um, in terms of South Africa, in terms of the biogas potential, so um, there are a number of studies that sort of collect the information around this. Um, the potential for biogas lies particularly within the agricultural space in terms of agricultural residues um, from livestock, um, in terms of your pigs. Um, cows, feedlots, um, as well as um, poultry. Um, then also there is opportunity within um, sort of these other sectors in terms of your, your sugar industry, um, your, your, your maize. However, it is sort of hesitant in terms of, of, of the discussion because the discussion around um, your feed versus fuel um, discussion always comes up around that. However, there are at least two projects in South Africa who uses a energy crop as a feedstock um, uh, or three projects that, that uses energy crop as a feedstock and the way they sort of manage this is that they are actually rehabilitating either mining land or in addition to feeding communities from that, that land that they're doing agricultural um, sort of um, growth of those crops. So those are sort of two ways that they've overcome the, the, the discussion feed to fuel discussion um, but there is opportunities um, um, and, and I rightfully agree, agree with France, there's a lot of opportunity in South Africa. It's just a matter of how you sort of set up your project um, to, to sort of meet that feedstock that's available that you may have identified. So it, it would be a uh, wheat straw uh, when I've yeah. uh, correctly have a understood this. So uh, I have I have a, another uh, statement, but I think this is uh, this is difficult to answer. Or yeah, it's it's not the, always the the right place here. So uh, when questions arise, please uh, please be more uh, precise. So uh, we we can deal with the questions. Uh, so such a statement is what well, is next? Uh, Europe and other countries in adopting this technology is very is very uh, difficult to to discuss. So yes, this is the, the reason why typical the project typical exists. Yeah? So um, if there are if there are other questions, I don't think they are not uh, very great. So yeah. Bernard, we should, sorry yeah. to interrupt, we should come back to about the plastic topics in the digest aid because this was read and I believe it was not very well solved or uh, replied. Uh, the plastics uh, problem in the digest is already Matthias uh, mentioned. Yeah. But we have the first uh, 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 post sieving results of digest date if plastic is included and we can reach the requirements from European fertilizer regulation. But still we have the problem in future if the topic of microplastic and it's a, it's a, it's a new wording maybe for, for plastics in general, but microplastics are sure also not uh, to be uh, excluded uh, if post-sieving, but post-sieving is a very good 
technique to reduce plastic so you can have a very clear digest state besides microplastic. Microplastic will always stay as a problem. And plastic in the digester is always a problem. The second approach is to use uh, biodegradable, degradable plastic, uh, which is compostable, but it will be not destroyed during the digestion process. So far we know there we have still do uh, lots of work to solve also the problem that it should be already by the degraded in the digestion process. So far not. Thank you very much. I will, I will stop the webinar now from my side and uh, please, Johannes, uh, it's your turn. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope you can uh, hear me again. Um, just putting up the final slide. Thank you very much for um, the um, <clears throat> the interest from from your side um, um, that was that was very interesting and uh, I've, I've monitored also the chat and, and your discussion and I saw that there's a lot of different expertise experiences um, in our audience of this web seminar this is this is what we want actually but it also causes uh, some um, yeah difficulties in a way on how to steer the and, and, and do the, the communications the Q and a session. Um, so I hope we were able to uh, address most of your comments, your questions. Um, we will share all the documents, um, the presentations, um, the recording, but also, um, uh, let's say, a fact sheet from your Q&A with a bit more information on, on your questions, more general answers to them um, uh, via our website. So uh, we will reach out to you um, with the registered email address that we have used for this web seminar. Um, we are also happy if you register for further upcoming information and further web seminars that we will have in the near future. Um, also use our website to register here and to receive that information. Um, we, we hope to have this, um, let's say, maybe unbalanced um, representation of stakeholders, um, those with more experience, those with less experience, with more um, practical questions with with more theoretical uh, questions and I just saw that there was a last question posted um, with with asking if there's a clear statement on that biogas is uh, in theory a great uh, tool and and but if it goes into the implementation there are needy greedy details that you need to be uh, aware of and uh, it's very sensitive to bio um, biological, chemical um, uh, topics, and which, which makes this topic of pre treatment quite an interesting and important topic. I think we, we heard that right from the beginning where we looked into the technical aspect uh, from Josef Höckner, um, technical um, and, and, and physical pretreatment, but also then with uh, later the examples from South Africa, what's actually happening and why sometimes um, biogas plants are not operational anymore uh, due to these um, difficulties and this is what we are what we want particularly from the dbco project uh, to to actually be very transparent and open to um, to yeah best practices lessons learned um, share that and explore what would be from a local perspective suitable and useful um, to, to, to be implemented and to be yeah, um, put forward in, in your respective country and region. Um, so yes, the answer is yes, in theory, but also in practice, it works. Um, we, we have uh, uh, thousands of um, biogas plants that are operational that work. Um, but it's also true, yes, that uh, on the on the various smaller details, uh, there are details that need to be um, in, incorporated and um, um, yeah, uh, looked at with 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 care, with real care. Um, so um, uh, it's both true; it works in theory, but also in practice. Um, but as always, there are needy greedy details to be looked at, uh, particularly. Um, I say thank you from my side also to all the um, analysts here, um, Yasin, Yosef, um, and uh, 
No. <laughs> I'm missing Matthias. something. Matthias. Matthias. Matthias, sorry. I, I, was just, <laughs> I was scrolling through the list of participants, but I couldn't find you anymore. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Um, as I said, we'll share all the information. I'm looking forward to you joining the next web seminar. Um, and again, apologies for the small technical glitch at the beginning. I'm very happy that um, so many of you made it uh, in the end to, to, the, to the Zoom web seminar mm -hmm. from the Dibico project. Thank you. Do we see if you just